The broadcast of the regular meeting of the Business Inspections, Housing and Zoning Committee will now begin. Good afternoon. Welcome to the regular meeting of the Business Inspections, Housing and Zoning Committee for today, which is March 30th. I'm Lisa Goodman and I'll be chairing the committee today. As we begin, I'll note for the record, this meeting has remote participation from members of the City Council and City staff as authorized under Minnesota Statute Section 13D.021 due to the declared local public health emergency. The City will be recording and posting this meeting on the City's website and YouTube channel as a means of increasing public access and transparency. This meeting is public and subject to the Minnesota Open Meeting Law. At this time, I'll ask the clerk to call the roll so we can verify a quorum for this meeting. Council Member Reich. Present. Council Member Gordon. Here. Council Member Osmond. Here. Council Member Ellison. Council Member Schrader. Here. Chair Goodman. Present. There are five members present. Thank you. The agenda for today's meeting is in front of us. I'll begin with the consent agenda, which is items 8 through 22. Item number 8 are liquor license renewals for March 30th. Item 9 are business operating conditions for Storm King Brew Pub and Barbecue. Item number 10 is a contract amendment with Aloha Landscaping. Item number 11 is a contract amendment with Metro Lawns. Item number 12 is a local historic designation for the Mary Lokren Student Rooming Houses Historic District. Item number 13 is the Minnesota Historic and Cultural Heritage Grant. Uh, this is for a local designation study at 4501 Hiawatha. Item number 14 is the Norway House. This is authorization for state bond funds uh, to accept that. Item number 15 is, an, is appropriating home and NSP program income. Item number 16 are the spring 2021 grant applications to the Met Council's Livable Communities Demonstration Account Program, as well as the Transit Oriented Development Pre-Development Grant Program. Item 17, our Great Streets Gap Financing Project is issuing a loan for Juxtaposition Arts Campus Expansion. Item 18 is Broadway Flats Affordable Housing Project. This is a first mortgage refinance and subordination. Item 19 is the McPhail Annual Report. Item number 20 are, commit, are appointments to the Minneapolis Arts Commission. And item 21 is a rezoning on behalf of Aspen Builders at 3840 Minnehaha. And item 22 is a rezoning on behalf of Alina Health at 2855 Chicago Avenue. Are there any, uh, is there any discussion on the consent portion of the agenda or any items anyone would like to pull for discussion? Uh, looking to see if any members of the council have any questions or comments on those consent agenda items. Seeing none, I'm going to move approval of items 8 through 22 and ask the clerk to please call the roll. Council Member Reich. Aye. Council Member Gordon. Aye. Council Member Osmond. Aye. Council Member Ellison. Council Member Schrader. Aye. Chair Goodman. Aye. There are five ayes. Those items carry and the consent agenda is approved. We'll move to the public hearing agenda, starting with item number one, which is the occupancy regulations ordinance. Um, I would invite Andrea uh, Bonsing to give a staff report. Good afternoon, Chair Goodman and Council Members. I'm Andra Bosniak, the Interagency Coordinator for Regulatory Services, and I'm here today to present updates to the Housing Code Occupancy Ordinance. Occupancy, or how many people can live together in one dwelling, was regulated in Minneapolis until 2019 by both the Zoning Code and the Housing Codes. In late 2019, the city removed occupancy limits from the Zoning Code due to a HUD directive that specifically called out the city's zoning rules as creating an additional barrier to fair housing. This amendment to the Housing Code further aligns this work and eliminates the requirement for one related family per dwelling by changing the definition of family to a household intending to live together long term. The physical space requirements currently in the Housing Code, such as the maximum number of people per bedroom, will continue to apply. This update seeks to have occupancy be more inclusive to the many household types that live together and allow non-related people the same renting rights as families. This is especially significant for low income residents or populations at risk of housing instability or those that are housing cost burdened. 
It also acknowledges a reality of the city's housing stock, older properties with small bedrooms and few three and four bedroom properties available for low income residents. Lastly, this change simplifies the enforcement process for both residents and inspectors. This concludes my presentation and I can stand for any questions that you might have. Are there any questions for staff on item number one? Seeing none, we'll go ahead and open the public hearing on item number one and ask the clerk if anyone is registered to speak on item number one. Seeing, go ahead. There's no one registered to speak. OK, thank you. Um, given that there's no one registered to speak, I am going to close the public hearing and call on Council Member Schrader. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'd like to move this item forward for approval. Item number one has been moved for approval. Are there any further comments or questions from members of the committee? Council Member Bender, thank you for being here today. Thanks, Madam Chair. Uh, you know, this topic was once um, subject to a lot more discussion. Uh, I think we've worked through uh, a lot of the details, and so now it's a relatively non-controversial uh, item. I just wanted to thank staff who've been working on this for a number of years, going back to last term. Um, as staff mentioned, it was part of the conversations around fair housing. Uh, and just thank you as well, Madam Chair, for, for facilitating this coming forward. Um, this is uh, you know, again, a relatively small change at this point, but part of a package of policies that we've been pursuing to make our housing in Minneapolis more resilient and more accessible for all people. And our current policies are outdated. They are restrictive. They do not reflect the reality of who lives together today. And they're really uh, based on an outdated notion of, of family and you know, the standing of people who are related to each other versus everyone else to be able to live together. So I'm proud of the work that we are doing to remove all of the different ways that we have seen um, discrimination or lack of equity in our housing policies. And this is one example of that package of reforms. So thanks again to everyone who's been involved and in, for the support. Thank you so much, Council President Bender, for being here and for all of your work on this. We'll see if anyone else has anything they'd like to add. Seeing none, I'd ask the clerk to please call the roll. Council Member Reich. Aye. Council Member Gordon. Aye. Council Member Osmond. Aye. Council Member Ellison. Council Member Schrader. Aye. Chair Goodman. Aye. There are five ayes. That carries and the motion is approved. With that, we'll move to our next public hearing, which is changes to our administrative hearing procedures ordinance. I'd invite Mr. Magrino to give that report. Hi, good afternoon, Chair Goodman and committee members. I'm Nick Magrino from Regulatory Services here to talk about changes to the administrative hearing process, which is chapter two of the Code of Ordinances. Um, these changes are mostly sort of housekeeping and administrative issues, things like changing the phrase tape record to audio record, adding some flexibility with, with designees, changing words like will to shall. Um, some of the things that are more substantive, um, we did add a specific process for requesting a subpoena at an administrative hearing. Previously, it was pretty open-ended how that was actually supposed to work. And so we added some, some dates and um, some roles and responsibilities for different people who would be involved in that. Uh, we also added some um, deadlines and dates, which would mostly be accountability for the city. So if we receive an appeal, we would have to set a hearing within a certain amount of time. And after the hearing, we'd have to give notice of the decision within a certain amount of time. Um, we also fleshed out the process by which people um, have special assessment hearings. That was sort of open-ended previously in the ordinance, and we wanted to codify that so that we actually had kind of a whole process outlined. It hasn't been a problem in the past. Uh, we've maintained our perfect district court record uh, for that type of appeal, but we did think that it made sense to to add some specificity into the ordinance um, so that if we ever got questions about what we were doing, um, we could say that that was uh, in chapter two. Um, I'm happy to stand for any questions that you might have. Thank you, Mr. Magrino, for all of that work. I know it's not the most glamorous work, but it's definitely um, an improvement to how we uh, work in the city. So thank you, and we'll see if there are any questions on your report. Seeing none, I'm going to open the public hearing on item number two and see if there's anyone here to speak to this issue. 
seeing that there are no registered speakers and no one is here to speak to this issue, I'll ask if there's any questions for anyone on the committee. And if not, I'd call on Council Member Schrader, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm happy to move this item forward for approval. On the, on the motion by Council Member Schrader to approve, I'll ask the clerk to please call the roll. Council Member Reich. Aye. Council Member Gordon. Aye. Council Member Osmond. Aye. Council Member Ellison. Council Member Schrader. Aye. Chair Goodman. Aye. There are five ayes. That carries and the motion is approved. Well, with that, we'll move to our next public hearing, which is item number three. These are changes to our animal licensing and procedures ordinance, and I will call on Saray to give that report, please. Hi, good, good afternoon, Chair Goodman. I'm Saray garnett Hohuli, Director of Operations and Engagement and Regulatory Services. And I am here to present updates to our department's animal licensing and procedures. Today, we are making two amendments to the animal control, uh, control code. First, we are closing a gap on our life, lifetime permit. Pet licenses are required starting at four months, and currently we require cats and dogs to be spayed, and ne spayed or neutered before they can receive a lifetime license. In order to eliminate a possible gap for some pets that may be spayed or neutered later, this update allows for a provisionary license until the time of spaying or neutering the cost of which can be applied towards uh, the lifetime license. Second, we are updating our rabies procedure. During the coronavirus pandemic, public safety demands allow agents to determine if an animal that bit a person could be safely quarantined at home rather than being kenneled at animal control. This has been a successful process as it provides constituents an opportunity to avoid kenneling fees, especially helpful for low income constituents while improving community relations and ensuring better compliance with our rabies procedures. We're also updating references to the current rabies authorities in Minnesota. This concludes my presentation and I can stand for questions. Are there any questions for staff on item number three? Seeing none, I'll open the public hearing on item number three and ask the clerk if there is anyone in queue to speak to these issues. Looks like there are no registered speakers. I'll see if there's any questions from members of the committee. If not, <laughs> I will uh, call on Council Member Schrader. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, this, like the other ordinance, I want to thank staff for all their work on this, and I'd like to move this forward for approval. On the motion by Council Member Schrader to move approval, seeing no further questions or comments, I will ask the clerk to please call the roll. Council Member Reich. Aye. Council Member Gordon. Aye. Council Member Osmond. Aye. Council Member Ellison. Aye. Council Member Schrader. Aye. Chair Goodman. Aye. There are six ayes. That carries and the motion is approved. With that, we'll move on to our next public hearing, which is item number four, the Border Avenue Extension Redevelopment Plan. And I will call on Ms. Grossen to give that report. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and, and Council Members. I'm Beth Grossen, Senior Project Coordinator in CPED Business Development. The Border Avenue Extension Redevelopment Plan has been prepared to improve multimodal circulation and redevelopment in an area near the Minneapolis Farmers Market and the future Royalston Southwest Light Rail Station. Planning documents for this area have long recommended extending Border Avenue south from Holden Street to Glenwood Avenue to help bring back the street grid. The Border Avenue Extension Project would secure a 60 foot right of way for a new street, sidewalks, pedestrian lighting, and possible bikeway. The boundary map shown shows the larger property holdings of the three impacted owners. Hennepin County's TOD program awarded funds in 2020 to help pay for the acquisition of right of way for the Border Avenue extension. The county TOD program requires the properties to be acquired to be within a redevelopment project area. To satisfy this requirement, city staff prepared the border plan. 
the second resolution um, uh, related to this matter modifies the common project plan to add this border plan and its geography to the common project and authorizes the use of tax increment revenue for infrastructure related costs. I'm available to answer any questions. Are there any questions for Ms. Grossen on item on this item? Seeing none, I will open the public hearing on item number four and ask the clerk if anyone here, if there's anyone here to speak to this issue. Seeing no one here to speak to this issue, I will close the public hearing and call on council member Ellison. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm happy to move approval of this item. Item number four has been moved uh, for approval by council member Ellison. Are there further comments or questions? Seeing none, I'd please ask the clerk to call the roll. Council member Reich. Aye. Council member Gordon. Aye. Council member Osmond. Aye. Council member Ellison. Aye. Council member Schrader. Aye. Chair Goodman. Aye. There are six ayes. That carries and the motion is approved. We'll now move on to item number five, which is public hearing five. This is the Baldwin Square redevelopment plan and modification to the common development and redevelopment plan. I'd call on Ms. Stern to give a report, please. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Goodman and committee members. I'm Emily Stern with CPED Business Development. The recommendation before you today is for approval of the Baldwin Square redevelopment plan. The Baldwin Square plan was prepared to facilitate neighborhood commercial, transit-oriented, and sustainable development and to create neighborhood employment opportunities in the area around 42nd and Fremont Avenue North, as you see on, this, on the, uh, the displayed map. As part of today's action, staff is also recommending approval of modifications to the Common Development and Redevelopment Plan and Common Tax Increment Financing Plan, known as the Common Project, to authorize the use of Common Project Tax Increment Revenue Funds for the council approved commercial property development fund loan associated with the rehabilitation of properties located at 4140 through 4154 Fremont Avenue North, located within the boundaries of the, of the, uh, the area that you see on the map. So just very briefly as background, in 2020 Ideal Development Group, the developer of the Baldwin Square project secured funding through the Hennepin County Transit Oriented Development Program to pay for redevelopment costs associated with these properties located within the project boundary on the map. Redevelopment plans for the site include re rehab of two existing buildings and new construction, which will create over 24,000 square feet of neighborhood commercial space for restaurant, retail, and office uses. The Hennepin County TOD program requires that the site be located within a redevelopment project area to receive the TOD funds and the redevelopment, the Baldwin Square plan was pre prepared to comply with the, the requirements of that program. On March 22nd, the Minneapolis Planning Commission reviewed the Baldwin Square plan and the modification to the common project uh, related to the plan and found them to be consistent with Minneapolis 2040 and to date no public comments have, have been received on either of these plans. Thank you for your consideration and I'm happy to answer any questions. Are there any questions for Ms. Stern on item number five? Seeing none, thank you for your report, Ms. Stern. We'll go ahead and open the public hearing on item number five and I see that Andrew McGlory is on the line to speak. Uh, Mr. McGlory, welcome to the meeting. The public hearing is open. If you'd like to make a few comments, you're welcome to do so now. Uh, Jamil Ford here. I'm also uh, representing uh, Baldwin Square. Um, I would just like to thank everybody for their uh, continued support and efforts, uh, both your city council as well as uh, CPED staff. Uh, this is a great project and we continue to have dialogues with the community organization as well as any other interested uh, individuals that have any questions or concerns for this project. Thank you much. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Ford yeah. for being here today. I appreciate you have your camera on as well. Um, is is Mr. Yeah. McGlory here and does he would would he like to speak? Is he part of your team, sir? He he is yeah. a part of my team. He I he's, just he's here. I just okay. everything that he said. 
Thank you so much for uh, taking the time to be on the call, Mr. McGlory. We appreciate it. Yeah. I'll ask the clerk if there's anyone else registered to speak on this issue. Seeing none, I'm going to close the public hearing and see if there are any questions or comments from members of the council. If not, I'll call on council member Ellison. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, once again, uh, really honored to move this item for approval. Excited about this project. Thank you, Council Member Ellison. Um, we will, on Council Member Ellison's motion, I'll ask the clerk to please call the roll. Council Member Reich. Aye. Council Member Gordon. Gordon. Aye. Council Member Osman. Aye. Council Member Ellison. Aye. Council Member Schrader. Aye. Chair Goodman. Aye. There are six ayes. That carries and the motion is approved. With that, we'll move to our next public hearing, uh, which is the Zoning Board of Adjustment Appointments. And I would ask Mr. Ellis to please give that report. Uh, thank you, Chair Goodman. Council members, I'd uh, just like to, um, to say a couple of words here and just give a little bit of a background on uh, some of the reappointments and then the new appointment uh, that we have going forward as recommended. Um, we have Matt Perry, who is the current chair and has served on the board for over a decade. Uh, he's an IT consultant and he's been very good about running meetings, uh, giving everybody the opportunity to speak and be heard by the board so that when people are before the board, they get a chance to be heard and have their opinions known. Uh, Jacob Softley or Jake Softley is an attorney uh, and he is the current vice chair. He has served the board for years as well, um, and he's been able to provide good legal insight for the board during their deliberations uh, when making a land use decision. Uh, Taylor Smikerova uh, has served one term for the board and is volunteering for her second now. Uh, she has a background in architecture and real estate development um, and currently works for Seward Redesign. And then finally, we have a new appointment um, because one of the board members had to step down uh, for family reasons. Uh, her name uh, would be ja is Jasmine Frias. Uh, Jasmine is a consultant with One House Partners and has been involved with the Planning and Zoning Committee in Newton, Iowa. So that gave her some background to understand what her role would be as a decision making decision maker on the Board of Adjustment. So thank you. Thank you so much, actually, uh, for that report, Mr. Ellis. That was very helpful to give us a sense of the context surrounding the, the roles of each of the people on the board who are being reappointed. Uh, I'll see if there are any questions from any members of the committee. Seeing no questions, I am going to open the public hearing and ask if there are any speakers in queue on this item. Seeing no speakers in queue on this item, I'm going to close the public hearing and call on Council Member Schrader. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I'm happy uh, to move this item forward and uh, move these um, appointees to the Board of Adjustments. Thank you, Council Member Schrader, for that motion. I'll ask the clerk to call the roll. Council Member Reich. Aye. Council Member Gordon. Aye. Council Member Osmond. Aye. Council Member Ellison. Aye. Council Member Schrader. Aye. Chair Goodman. Aye. There are six ayes. That item, that carries and the motion is approved. We'll now move on to our quasi-judicial public hearing, which is item number seven. Uh, this is a variance appeal by Anthony Bender on behalf of Reef Kitchens. This item was continued from a previous meeting and subsequently the applicant has withdrawn their appeal. I'm going to proceed to open the public hearing uh, and ask if there are any, uh, if there's anyone in queue on the item, and then I will move to withdraw the appeal after the public hearing. Are there any, is there anyone in queue to speak to item number seven? It does not look as though anyone is signed on to speak to item number seven, so I'm going to close the public hearing and I'll move to withdraw this appeal at the staff recommendation and ask the clerk to call the roll. Council Member Reich. Aye. Council Member Gordon. Aye. Council Member Osmond. Aye. Council Member Ellison. Aye. Council Member Schrader. Aye. Chair Goodman. Aye. There are six ayes. That motion is withdrawn then and that passes. 
So we'll then move on to our two discussion items, starting with item number 23. This is a receive and file presentation on the 2021 Emergency Rental Assistance Program. Um, we're very happy to have uh, Katie Topinka and her team here today. Uh, it's very important that everyone on the council and as many people as possible actually really know about what's happening with rental assistance because each and every one of us can be helpful in getting the information out. Uh, so I am going to turn this over to our staff team to give a presentation and thank them for being here today. Uh, thank you, Chair Goodman and committee members. I'm Katie Topinka, the Housing Policy Coordinator at CPED, um, and presenting along with me today is um, Jamie Radel, uh, who is a Senior Project Coordinator with CPED Housing, who is, um, we are working together on, on getting this program um, up and running. Um, so uh, next slide, please. Um, we are going to give an overview of the um, uh, Minneapolis COVID Emergency Rental Assistance Program. Um, here's a brief overview of our presentation. We're going to talk a bit about um, what we learned from the GAP Funds for Housing program last year and how that's informing um, the work for this program, um, some of our outreach strategies, and then um, the, the eligibility requirements and, and how to prepare to apply for these funds. Um, the state of Minnesota received $375 million in emergency rental assistance funds from the coronavirus relief package um, that was passed um, by Congress at the end of 2020. Um, of that total, Minneapolis received a direct allocation of $12.8 million. Um, all cities or counties with a population of over 200,000 people were eligible to receive direct allocations. So uh, we did opt to receive that, as did many of our um, neighboring jurisdictions in the metro area. Um, there was another uh, round of emergency rental assistance included in the American Rescue Act that was just recently passed. So we do anticipate receiving another nine to $11 million um, of, of funds for the city of Minneapolis uh, for our renters um, for emergency rental assistance. Um, we hope to roll that funding into this, this program that we are currently developing. Um, the funding under uh, this program can be used to pay back rent and utilities. Um, and uh, renters can apply on their own behalf or landlords can apply on behalf of their renters. Um, it can pay back rent and utilities um, going back to March 13th of 2020. Um, it can also be used to pay uh, up to three months of prospective rent uh, for up to 12 months of assistance. And that um, prospective rent can be uh, extended for an additional three months if there is funding available. Um, we are working very closely with our jurisdictional partners in the metro area and with the state of Minnesota um, and with trusted community organizations to set up a system to, to get these funds out, um, out as soon as we can. So uh, next slide, please. Um, as you are all aware, um, last year, very early in the pandemic, um, the city um, launched a GAP funds for housing program, which did provide emergency housing assistance. Um, and it was one of the very first uh, emergency rental assistance programs available in the state of Minnesota. Um, and through the course of that program, we approved more than 1,600 applications, providing more than $2.6 million in rent and utility assistance directly to Minneapolis renters. Um, over 85% of the approved applicants identified as, as BIPOC households, Black, Indigenous, People of Color households. Um, th there is a link in the RCA on this agenda item to our publicly available dashboard that has more information about the results of that program. And um, we are going to have a full reporting of that program uh, later this year. But we wanted to raise it here in this presentation because we learned a lot from that program that's helping inform how we're designing uh, uh, this current, this new emergency rental assistance program. And those lessons are highlighted here on this slide, um, which are that there is a need for a one-stop application um, for assistance across jurisdictions. Um, and I'll go into that more of that on the next slide, but basically, um, Last year, there were a number of different programs available at the same time that provided emergency rental assistance. They all had different applications and slightly different requirements, and it created a lot of confusion both for renters and uh, the organizations administering the programs. So in this 
uh, program, we're working very hard to try to create one application across jurisdictions. Um, we also learned, and one of the big successes of the GAP funds program was that um, working with our trusted community partners and community organizations to provide outreach, program navigation, and to uh, review applications is really critical to reaching hard to reach populations and to helping people successfully apply for these funds. Um, and then we also learned that it's important um, to try to minimize the wait time between when an application is complete and when a determination for assistance is made. Um, and then also that applicants have a way to check um, the status of their applications as they're waiting to find out if they've received assistance. Um, so I will go into more detail about how we're building on these lessons uh, in the next slide. So next slide, please. Um, so as I mentioned uh, already, we are collaborating with the state of Minnesota and the other local jurisdictions that receive direct allocations of funds um, to try to create one application. Um, and this will be a web-based application um, with, if not identical, then very closely aligned requirements for the program. Um, and uh, this application will also have a way for um, both people who are processing the applications and applicants themselves to check on the status of their application. So that gets at that um, uh, lesson learned I mentioned in the last slide. Um, the other, the next bullet here is that we are working with trusted local partners to administer our program. So um, we uh, found in the um, GAP funds program that it was very important to have these local administrators working with uh, community um, to help people navigate the application process. Our, the role of the processors um, is to help ensure that applicants can successfully complete their applications as well as to review them and process payments. Um, we have um, selected uh, five pro local processors to run our tenant-based application program, and then we also selected a, a processor for the landlord-based application, which I'll talk about shortly. Um, for the tenant program, we are working with North Point Health and Wellness, New American Development Center, uh, Comunidades Latinas Unidas and Servicios, or CLUES, Lutheran Social Service, and Minneapolis Public Housing Authority. And each of these uh, organizations has a different um, specialty or focus, whether it be a geographic area or working with um, specific people who speak uh, certain languages or from certain cultural communities. And so we are working closely with them to make sure that we can reach as many of our residents as possible with this program. Um, and then I mentioned that we're working with MPHA as well. Um, one important distinction uh, from this with this program from the programs that were available last year is that recipients of housing choice vouchers and public housing residents are eligible to receive assistance. That was not the case in previous programs. Um, and so they are eligible to receive assistance for the tenant based portion of their rent, uh, not for the portion that that MPHA is covering. Um, and so we will be partnering with MPHA to make sure that they can get that information out to housing choice voucher holders. Um, and we that is a really important change from last year because we know there were a lot of people receiving rental assistance who were in need of assistance and we're not able to get it. Um, and then uh, I mentioned that under this program and under the, um, the federal uh, requirements, uh, tenants can apply directly for assistance. That assistance does need to go to their landlord um, with an exception, which is that if a landlord is not cooperating, then the assistance can go directly to a tenant. Um, landlords can also apply on behalf of their tenants. They do have to get um, permission from their tenants to do so, but they can do that. So with that in mind, we have also partnered with our um, uh, several other local jurisdictions, which include Hennepin County, uh, Ramsey County, Dakota County, and the city of St. Paul to jointly select an administrator to process landlord-based applications. That administrator is a Family Housing Fund who is partnering with Housing Link um, and, and Clifton Larson Allen, and they will be administering landlord-based applications and assisting landlords to, um, to get uh, payments of back rent made on their behalf as well. Um, the uh, third bullet here, um, we are issuing an RFP 
um, jointly with Hennepin County to hire housing assistance navigators to provide additional support to applicants. So this will be going out um, sh uh, very shortly to community based organizations um, who we will um, hire using community development block grant COVID relief funds um, to provide even more support um, to our community members to help them successfully apply for funds under this program. Um, and then um, we are coordinating very closely with the state and Hennepin County on a waterfall approach to processing applications. Um, and this gets at the lesson learned um, from last time of trying to minimize wait time between when somebody applies and when their application is approved. So both the state's portion of funds and Hennepin County's uh, direct allocation of funds can also be used to serve Minneapolis residents. And so we are working to coordinate together um, to manage the workflow um, among our processors and then the state and Hennepin County's processors so that if one processor is um, sort of at the maximum number of applications that they can process for a given period of time, we'll reroute the applications to Hennepin County or the state. And we're hoping that will really help um, run this program efficiently. Um, I did want to note here that um, Hennepin County did launch uh, an early um, sprint where they did make some of their emergency rental assistance funds available um, uh, for applicants, including Minneapolis residents. Um, they received um, over 30, almost 3,800 applications. Um, and almost 2,000 of those were from Minneapolis residents. That early sprint is now closed and they are processing those applications. We accepted a small number of those applications um, to, for our Minneapolis processors to, to process and they are currently doing that. Um, but we, uh, so next slide please. Um, so. I'm going to close out my part of this presentation here just talking a little bit about some of our outreach strategies and and then other policy initiatives we're working on before I turn it over to Jamie to talk about the eligibility requirements and how to get ready to apply. So we are anticipating a statewide program launch um, for uh, for the emergency rental assistance program in about mid April and we will um, certainly be getting the word out when that date is finalized. We are working with our partners to finalize a launch date. There will be a number of outreach efforts through social media, the city website. Um, uh, we are going to partner with um, NCR um, to get the word out through our cultural radio programs. There will be a state um, but we will also be partnering with regulatory services um, to do outreach to property owners uh, through the rental licensing um, system and also um, with our 4D uh, participants to get the word out to those property owners in our city's 4D program. Uh, we also plan to coordinate with the health department to provide information at other community events like vaccination sites or food distribution sites. Um, there will be a state-led outreach campaign and kickoff event um, when the program is ready to launch. And there is a centralized website um, that we will all be referring applicants to. It's renthelpmn.org. Um, that is the link to it here in the PowerPoint. Um, and Currently, the site is live. Um, it has information about how to prepare to apply, um, and it will include the link to the application when that is up and running. Um, and then just wanted to note here that um, we are currently still under the eviction moratorium that has been in place um, since March of last year. Uh, the state moratorium is um, has been extended most recently through April 13th. Um, and uh, they have been, the eviction moratorium has been extended up to this point um, each time that the, the governor's peacetime emergency powers have been extended. Um, the federal eviction moratorium was also just extended um, through June 30th. Um, staff are working on um, or, uh, ordinances uh, that were introduced in February um, that include just cause and eviction pre-filing policies. We are planning to bring those forward for public hearing and council consideration in May. Um, and uh, we will be giving a more detailed overview of the goals of those policies at POGO on um, April 14th, but just wanted to mention those here as we're talking about um, eviction prevention. Um, and then just also wanted to remind um, you that we 
last year provided additional funding to legal aid uh, for eviction representation. Um, if we have a 1.2 million contract through um, quarter one of 2022 to provide eviction representation services, and that's also in anticipation and in supporting all of the efforts around eviction prevention. Um, so. Uh, quickly, we're uh, wrapping up here, but Jamie Radel is just going to talk quickly about the basic eligibility requirements and how to get ready to apply for this program. Okay, before we do that, maybe we'll see if there are questions or comments on the bulk of the report. I have two while everyone else is determining if they have questions or comments. Just my first comment is um, thank you for everything you're doing. I'm wondering if all of this information in a helpful way could be put into a one page document that council members could put out in their newsletters and um, get out at community meetings and share as well just so we could be part of explaining how people can move this forward. Maybe it can just be a, a redo of part of these slides. Um, and then my second question has to do, I'm on the Family Housing Fund Board, so I know a little bit about the Family Housing Fund's work in this regard. I've heard from many landlords that they can't get the tenants to agree to file um, for some sort of um, help. And that the reason for this is because they know they can't be evicted anyway, so they don't want to be bothered. I'm wondering if we're finding truth to that and or how we can assist in making sure that that does not happen. Um, this was a policy that's supposed to help everybody, you know, all boats rise. And what happens if a tenant says, well, I'm just not going to give you the information you need in order to get rent assistance because there's no downside for me. Um, can you speak to that? I wish I had only heard it once, but I've heard it more than once. So maybe there's some issues with some of these tenants, but I'm just curious if you could speak to that. Sure, thanks, Councilmember Goodman. Um, to your first question, yes, we can definitely, uh, we are working with our marketing and communications teams to get this into different formats um, for council offices to be able to share. So we will definitely get that information to you. Um, in terms of the question about um, uh, whether um, there's a way for assistance if the tenants do not cooperate. So um, the, the, the statutory language, and I might have Jamie chime in here too if I'm not getting this quite right, but it, it does, on the federal, um, the bill did require that landlords notify their tenants um, if they are applying on their behalf, and they do have to um, provide some documentation to be able to do that on um, income or uh, income eligibility. Um, and so, um, so to get to the issue that you're describing, uh, I think it, it we may need to really focus on um, marketing, communication, and and getting the word out to tenants that um, that although there is an eviction moratorium, um, rent still needs to be paid, and the moratorium will end at some point, um, which is why it's even more critical to get caught up on rent. Um, so. Um, I think the, the reason we're using both strategies um, to have a landlord-based application and a tenant-based application is that our hope is that that will reach as many people as possible, but, um, but we do still need sort of uh, landlords to agree to participate and tenants to agree to participate to make it successful. Um, and Jamie, I don't know if you have anything to add to that, uh, but but I, I think there are some, you know, still some challenges that we have to work on to make sure the program can work well for everyone. So perhaps Jamie can speak to it. Maybe I'm the only one who's heard this, but I've heard it fairly frequently from a similar kind of area in my ward. And before, tenants had to do a lot. And so that was a lot to put on them. And so when landlords said there's rental assistance that's available, they had to go through a bunch of hoops and they just didn't want to do it. Now we're allowing landlords to apply, but they have to get income information from tenants who also don't want to do that. And so what is the path to help with this? Is there such a thing? Um, I, I'm just curious. I, maybe I'm the only one who's hearing this, but um, I've heard it more than once. And Councilmember Gordon, maybe one other thing I can add um, to that is that one of our goals, and, and I think Jamie will get into this, is um, in our it's a shared goal across the jurisdictions, is to try to make the application process itself as easy as as possible. Um, and so we do have to follow 
the Treasury guidelines um, that they're providing, which do require some documentation for income eligibility. But there are ways um, where we can just allow for written attestations so that we're hoping that we don't have to ask people to put together as many documents uh, as before. So the Treasury guidance does allow for more flexibility than previous programs have had. Um, and that's one of the ways we're hoping we can get um, more people to be able to to participate. OK, thank you. Doesn't really answer the question. So that happens and there's nothing we can do about it. Basically, <laughs> it's kind of what I'm hearing. <laughs> Um, I, I think it, it, it might be helpful also, um, I can follow up with you more after the meeting as well, because Hennepin County did run a landlord-based application program last year, and I think they found um, that they were able to successfully um, provide a lot of funding to landlords through that process. And so we can certainly um, get a little bit more information about the lessons they learned from that to, to follow up with you um, to help fill in the gaps <laughs> on my answer here. OK, because I think in the end, it's going to be terrible for a tenant who doesn't cooperate now. They'll be evicted when the when the moratorium wears off and then they'll have a, you know, a, a negative on their record that they didn't need to have. And so I think we almost have to explain why it's important um, so that later on when the moratorium wears off, they don't get evicted or they end up being evicted for not payment and then have an unlawful detainer and all these other horrible things happen. I'm not sure that some tenants realize that and we should try to help them understand why it's important. Thank you. Uh, so feel free to, uh, Council Member Schrader. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I, I wanted to, you know, first of all, thank staff for all this great work. Like, I really uh, appreciate the approach of learning from kind of what um, previous programs. Uh, my my question would be because I, a lot of this is really gearing up for the federal funding we're going to see, and also the end of the um, well, the moratorium on evictions. And I wanted to see if you had some kind of data about how how big the problem is. Like, how many households are you expecting to be, you know, um, be kind of not be able to pay rent when that becomes due and kind of how much, uh, what percentage of will be taken care of with these programs. Uh, thanks, Council Member Shader. That's a good question. Our current estimates are that with this program will be with the first round of funding that we've received that we'll be able to serve about 2500 uh, Minneapolis households. The average assistance um, that Hennepin County was providing in its early sprint was about $4,000 per household. Um, the need is higher than that, but as I mentioned, um, the state and Hennepin County's funding can also go to support Minneapolis residents. Um, and so I'm going to try to, I, I believe we have some estimates of how many households are behind, so I will try to make sure we get that um, shortly. Uh, hopefully I can get that to you before Jamie's done with her part of the presentation because I don't have it at my fingertips. I, um, I What I do know though is that given this first round of funding that we've received and the additional funding that we will be receiving, we do anticipate that we will be able to meet a, a lot of the need that is out there. So um, that is the good news. You know, I think last year when we only had three million dollars available for gap funds, um, we had to make decisions about, um, we knew it was going to be not enough. And so we had to make policy decisions around how to prioritize who should get the funding. And we're not in that same type of uh, position right now. We, um, so we're not doing things like limiting the amount of back rent that can be covered or even um, limiting the ability to cover prospective rent because we feel, um, and, and this is true across our jurisdictional partners as well, feel pretty confident that this, uh, that there is uh, enough funding to meet the need that is out there. Okay, thank you very much. Are there other questions from members of the committee? If not, we'll go ahead and complete the report. Okay, why don't you go ahead and complete the report? Uh, thanks, Chair Goodman um, and committee members. I'm Jamie Radel. I'm a senior project coordinator with CPED's residential finance team, and I'm just going to give you a very brief overview of program eligibilities and materials that residents can, uh, who are considering applying to the program should begin to gather in preparation for that application. 
Um, federal legislation established three eligibility requirements, and those included some type of economic hardship, a risk of homelessness or housing instability, and a, a, an income requirement. Economic hardship includes those who are unemployed or those who have experienced a reduced income, similar to the requirements to, in the early um, rent assistance program, such as the city's gap fund program. Um, however, this program expanded hardship to include those households who have in, incurred significant costs to COVID or have experienced a, a financial hardship directly or indirectly due to COVID-19. Um, we feel this is an enhancement to this program. Um, the, the hardship requirement of being unemployed or re, uh, having a reduced income due to COVID-19 um, caused um, the unfortunate screening out of households that were in need of assistance. Households also need to be at risk of housing instability or homelessness, which, homelessness, which is assessed through past due rent or utility bills and or through the documentation on, of unsafe living conditions. Finally, income must be at or below 80% of area median income, which can be documented as the 2020 annual income through federal tax returns, documentation of income determination uh, used for other assistance programs, or by using monthly income projected into an annual annualized income. In addition to these requirements, the federal, uh, the federal program uh, provided rules around household prioritization. So those households who have been unemployed for more than 90 days at the time of application or are, or are at 50% of area median income or less must be prior, are, need to be prioritized through this program. Next slide, please. Our pro, as Katie alluded to, our program is designed to allow for self attestation wherever possible, um, which makes this applica application more accessible to an additional uh, number of households. Um, federal guidelines are requiring documentation of income with some limited exceptions and documentation of rent and utilities owed, again, with some limited exceptions. To help our residents prepare to submit an application, they should begin to gather needed documentation around income and rent and utilities due. By far the most efficient way that an applicant can document their income is by submitting their 2020, 2020 household, their household's 2020 federal tax returns. Um, if they do such and they come back for a subsequent uh, prospective rent payments, um, the household will not need to redocument their income or re-income qualify at that time. Um, if their tax returns are unavailable or they do not file taxes, they will need to provide other forms of documentation, a month of pay stubs, bank statements showing regular um, deposits, um, social, social security insurance payments, uh, social security payments, attestation from an employer, um, unemployment statements, or an income determination from another agency since uh, January 1st of 2020. Um, if you are unemployed, um, finding your, the copy of your unins uh, unemployment insurance documentation will um, also make it easier for you to either um, be, become part of the prioritization or document that hardship that we talked about as one of the other um, criteria. Um, rent and utilities owed is another thing that you're that they will need to document. So finding their leases, um, finding past due notices, rent ledgers, attest or attestations from the landlord. Um, and utility bills are going to be very helpful for that. There are options for self-attestation for income and rent owed, um, but those are to be used as, except, as exceptions and not as standard practice. And if you have any questions on that, I'm happy to answer those. Are there any questions from members of the committee on this portion of the report? Seeing none, thank you. We'll see if there's any further information to share. Anything else staff would like to report on this item? No, thank you. Thank you so much for the report. Um, I will just note to members of the committee and other council members that we will be getting some information that we can use to pass on to constituents, which I think is going to be really helpful as we help participate in getting the word out so that um, we have a proactive way to ensure that residents can stay in their apartments. Uh, well then, uh, this is a receive and file item, and so I don't see any discussion, so I'll direct the clerk to receive and file the report and thank staff. I know this is a monumental effort and there are dozens and dozens of city staff members and nonprofits working with us to ensure that um, people can stay in their existing housing and we really greatly appreciate all of your effort. 
With that, we'll move to our last discussion item. Uh, this is item number 24. This is approving program guidelines uh, for a um, forgivable loan program at George Floyd Square. And I will ask um, uh, Eric Hansen if he would like to give this report. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Goodman, uh, members of the committee. My name is Eric Hansen. I'm the city's director of economic policy and development. I think we're getting some slides up. Um, you can go to the next slide, please. Hold on. All right. The businesses and organizations located in the immediate area of 38th and Chicago have experienced an exceptional economic burden as the location of Mr. George Floyd's death and the subs subsequent closing of the intersection to regular vehicle traffic. Existing city programs are inadequate to address the losses those in the square bounded by 37th to 39th streets along Chicago Avenue and between Elliott and Columbus Avenues along East 38th Street. And this program, the George, George Floyd Square 38th and Chicago for, Forgivable Loan Program proposal in front of you provides economic development assistance to businesses in this area in the form of patient forgivable working capital funds on favorable terms. Next slide. This pro program provides one time $50,000, a $50,000 loan interest free to privately held businesses, nonprofits and property owners for working capital uses that can be forgiven if the business or organization remains open and in place for one year. Payments would be required if the borrower moves or sells unless the city approves the buyer. No payments are due in the first year and the loan, and if the loans are not forgiven, the borrower, borrower would need to repay that loan over the last nine years of the loan's term. These loans take no collateral positions. Next slide. This loan repurposes a portion of the city's budgeted small business loan pool. We expect around half of that pool or around a million dollars to be used for this program. The remaining balance would still be available for conventional 2% uh, loan, uh, loans throughout the city. And applicants of multiple properties or businesses or those who own both their business and their properties would only be eligible for one loan from this program. Our CPET staff and business development would service this program, and we are currently developing an application process. And if approved, funds should be available and out to borrowers in about six weeks. Uh, next slide, please. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have, and thank you for the time today. Thank you for that overview, Mr. Hansen, and for your teams getting everything together so quickly in order to shift our priorities with regard to this program. I'll see if there are any comments or questions from members of the committee. Anyone? Seeing none, I will call on Council Member Schrader. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I'm happy to move this forward for approval. Item number eight has been moved forward for approval. Um, seeing no further comments or questions, I'll ask the clerk to call the roll. Council Member Reich. Aye. Council Member Gordon. Aye. Council Member Osmond. Aye. Council Member Ellison. Aye. Council Member Schrader. Aye. Chair Goodman. Aye. There are six ayes. That carries and the motion is approved. Seeing no further business before us and without any objection, I will declare the meeting adjourned. Thank you all for being here today.